Good news, everyone. The producers caved. Yay! But it's not over yet. Boo. On September 24th, the WGA announced that they and the AMPTP have an agreement in principle for a new three-year contract, and they're ready to draft the agreement for ratification by the Guild membership. Which is great, and we want to send a big congratulations out to the WGA, their negotiating committee, and all the Guild members, because not only is a fair deal hopefully right around the corner, but you've proven yet again that strikes fucking work. Fucking in A. Strikes are disruptive, of course, but they're supposed to be. When business as usual ain't cutting it anymore, workers have no choice but to unite, organize, stand up for what's fair, and strike. Everything that you like about your job, the pay, the bennies, the sick time, the vacation, the holidays, all of that is thanks to a union. And if you don't have that shit, or if you have it but it's not enough, that's thanks to a boss. And that's no hyperbole. We've said it before and we'll say it again. Unions are your friend. They benefit workers and they protect labor from exploitation by the bosses. That's right. If unions didn't benefit labor, corporations wouldn't spend so much time and money lobbying to make them illegal. If something scares the bosses, it's good for the workers. All workers. Plumbers. Electricians. Teachers. Truck drivers. Animators. Auto workers. Directors. Baristas. Forklift operators. Writers. Hotel employees. Strippers. Fuck Fuck yeah. yeah. And actors. SAG-AFTRA is still striking for a fair deal because the producers haven't come back to the negotiating table. So Hollywood's historic labor movement marches on. So as always, if you can, toss some scratch to entertainmentcommunity.org. Hollywood isn't back in production yet, but it will be soon because labor is fucking winning. And labor will always win, as long as we stand arm in arm, picket signs in hand, in solidarity. You can cut down our shade, you can bust up our sidewalks, but you'll never break our spirit. Labor's rallying cry will ring out, they have the plant, but we have the power. (laughs) I don't remember that one from the Communist Manifesto. It's from The Simpsons. I know. Hey, Adam, Lisa needs braces. (sighs) Dental plan right there, <laughs> thanks to a labor union. Yeah. By the way, what clown said that eyes and teeth aren't just covered by your medical insurance? Why are those separate plans? You know what? It never made... Th- okay, here's the... It, so it's probably part of due to the pharmaceutical <laughs> lobbies, right? I bet you they're thinking, oh, we got eye doctor. Hi, I'm JP. And I'm Adam. I've never seen Lost. I have. I'm told that it's good. I liked it. I'm told that it made sense. Sort of. But we're watching it out of order. So it definitely won't make sense. But it might still be good. Since we won't expect it to make sense, we'll still be able to appreciate each episode on its own merits as a one-hour story. Sometimes two or three. As opposed to just a fraction of an ongoing, sprawling, and increasingly complex tangle of relationships, personal stories, mysteries, mythologies, experiments, social dynamics, unnatural disasters, unanswered questions, and hot tropical hookups. Are you okay? I'm not sure. Because you lost me a little bit there at the end. Well, good, because I've been lost since the beginning. We're, We're lost, lost on Lost. Welcome, everybody, to Lost on Lost, The Lost Effect. Hey, I'm J.P. Russell, and I'm joined, as always, by a man who would appreciate if you stayed the fuck out of his storage unit, Adam Busher. That's right. I pay $90 a month for that. That is my home away from home, my hidey hole, my special, it's my mind palace, and I don't want you in it. (laughs) So, Adam, uh, you know that other show that we sometimes talk about, Lost? (laughs) Uh, Vaguely. Yeah, so uh, as I've mentioned several times before, I, I had watched maybe four or five total episodes of that show. Yes. Um, I have also watched six episodes of Fringe <laughs> randomly from like season two. I sat down one day with Noah B. Totsky. Yeah. The, the B stands for Brandle. And um, <laughs> he randomly just popped in like season two of Fringe. And every time the like title card would come up and Fringe would come on, mm-hmm. one of us would have to yell, Science! <laughs> and then the other one would wave their hand in like the maybe motion and go, eh, more or less. More so. Or less. Uh, I just want everyone and Noah to know that I did that to a, a room full of just me and my cats <laughs> while watching this pilot. Keeping yeah. the tradition alive. I hope the cats yes. appreciated it. And then they yelled, <laughs> science, maybe. <laughs> Today we are talking about the pilot episode of Fringe, the first episode of season one, and the first episode overall. Our centric character is Jesus Christ, that's Jason Bourne, I mean Agent <laughs> Olivia Dunham. <laughs> 
<laughs> Adam, do you have a recap? Uh, I certainly do. And uh, because this is the midseason, because this is the lost on lost effect, this is an experimental recap. It is an interactive recap. I'm excited. <laughs> JP and our mystery guest, you're both welcome to participate. And then once we're done, we will reveal who our mystery guest is. I'm just going to go on the deprivation tank and you can see me. Call me at the end. Yeah. <clears throat> Harvard? Why don't you go give me a Duncan Gordon Wood? <laughs> Over the Atlantic, we see flight number... Uh, Oceanic 815. 815? Wrong! It's flight 80085, Hamburg to Boston Direct. <laughs> As though those flights exist, everybody on board melts, probably because that one dude's insulin cost him a year's salary. Uh. Roadside, we meet agents Olivia Dunham and John Scott, two folks too hot to have chosen the FBI as a career path. Mm -hmm. These federal investigators are busy investigating each other's underpants when they get called to check out the Jell-O Pops at Logan International. <laughs> Here we meet that guy, you know, one of those guys that you see in things all the time, Kirk Saban. <laughs> Yeah. Playing. Yeah. He's a band of brothers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. He was in Oz. He was in Third Watch. He was in 12 Monkeys. Yeah. Playing Special Agent Charlie Francis. And we also meet the long dick of the law, Special Agent in Charge <laughs> Philip Broyles, also from Oz. Now, holy shit. Here's the next question What does DHS stand for? Department, Department of, Homeland Security. of Homeland Security? Incorrect. It is the Department of We Do Whatever We Want Since 9-11. Anyway, <laughs> since maybe this was terrorism, let's get hunting. John and Livy check out a storage unit, violate the Fourth Amendment, make goo-goo eyes, and let the bad guy get away. Oh, and John gets slimed. Slime. Since Livy loves John, she wants to spring Dr. Walter Bishop from the Who's Gow, but he can only be released to family, so Livy jumps on a quick flight to... Baghdad. <laughs> I don't want to wait for our <laughs> lives to be over. I want to know right now what it will be. And there's Pacey. That's right. More hot folks. Pacey Bishop. Sorry, Peter Bishop is trying to get in on fixing the crippled infrastructure of Iraq. Quick, how much money did the occupation authority lose track of in Iraq? Oh, uh, all of it. Three billion. Nearly nine billion dollars, according to the DOJ. <laughs> that one's actually true. Anyway, <laughs> Peter and Livy. <laughs> anyway, Peter and Livy spring Walter and get the old lab back together. John is slowly turning into some kind of crystal, so they should get him into some sun so he can absorb some positive energy. At least that's what my sister tells me to do with my crystals. <laughs> Walter convinces Livy to get lit and get wet so she can talk to John, and they find the bad guy, a David Dast Malchian knockoff. They violate the Fifth Amendment and make John all better. Sadly, he's a bad guy. <laughs> Livy chases him through the Toronto, <clears throat> sorry, Boston streets, and he dies in her arms. What were his final words? Uh, something sentimental. Uh, these nuts? I don't know. Incorrect. They were avoid the noid. Who is William Bell? What is the pattern? Where are my car keys? It's Pilot from Fringe here on Lost on Lost, the Lost Effect. Oh, wow. That was a good recap. That was impressive. That took me a half an hour to write. <laughs> How long did it take you to read? <laughs> <laughs> JP, we have a guest. What? <laughs> yeah. It's not really a mystery because we said who it was going to be last time, didn't we? If we didn't, returning for his third appearance here on uh, Lost on Lost. I can't count that high. <laughs> it's Adam Haas, ladies and gentlemen. Howdy. Welcome back. The only other guest uh, besides me who knows that the flight to Iraq is uh, very short. <laughs> <laughs> yes. You, you can you, watch you, the entire thing in an hour and a half. Yeah. You can definitely yeah. <laughs> do it in a single engine private plane, right? <laughs> yeah. Super. So Super easy flight to make. Very comfortable, easy, yeah. enjoyable. Do it all the time. Yeah. Haas, how you been, man? What's uh, what's new besides fun employment? Uh, you know, not much. Just enjoying watching some great television these days. Yeah, what have you been watching? I am now getting caught up on Succession. Yeah, We're into yeah. oh, season sure. two, yeah. um, halfway through season two. Yeah, that's supposed Haven't to be watched sure. any of it, trying to avoid all the spoilers, because I know it just ended. Yeah, that's supposed to be great television. I haven't uh, finished season four, but yeah, mm -hmm. season first three seasons I loved. It's and enjoying, I, I'm, well, I'm enjoying it. It's very good. Cool. Uh, so yeah, Succession. No, that's good stuff. Uh, but the reason you're here, beyond the fact that you know we like having you as a guest, is you uh, you have seen most of Fringe, all of Fringe. I've seen the entirety of Fringe while it was uh, playing live. Yeah, as I say, you mm -hmm. were. Um, 
I was an early watcher. Yeah. I don't think I fought, watched like the pilot live. I caught the show sometime mid season one. Okay. Back sure. in so, 2008. Pretty, pretty early adopter. Yeah. Yeah. Nice. You're a fan? Uh, definitely a fan. I've enjoyed the show the whole way through. I enjoy its uh, mythologicalness of it. Mm-hmm. It's uh, the little Easter eggs that they hide everywhere yeah. mm-hmm, mm-hmm, mm-hmm. are really good. Some that I did not even understand until I went back and saw online that are really incredible. Yeah. Yeah. Very cool. Awesome. It's like a show like with a plan. <laughs> like when they start, they're like, we know how this is going to yeah. go. Let's put some stuff in here. We've got a whole Bible of stuff yeah. like to make. And they almost didn't get to pull it off, too. Because as it went along, like come season four, like the ratings weren't stunning. Mm-hmm. It is a genre show. So, mm-hmm. you know, its audience right. is going to be limited compared to like your more broad stuff. But yeah, I think they kind of had to like petition for their final season. I think the final season was shorter. I think there was shorter. Because yeah. they, only, they only ended up making, they made like exactly 100 episodes. Mm-hmm. Uh, and the first four seasons were like all your normal broadcast 22, low 22, something like that. And then your last season was 12 <laughs> to go from oh. like 88 to 100. Yeah. Yeah. So last season was 13. There you go. 13. Yeah. Every other season was 22. Mm-hmm. Holy 23. shit. <laughs> Well, uh, should we get into it? Yeah, let's do it. Let's fucking get into some Fringe, baby. The pilot of Fringe originally aired on September 9th, 2008. It was written by J.J. Abrams, Alex Kurtzman, and Robert Orsi. Is that how you pronounce that? Orsi? Orky? Orsi? I think it's Orsi. Orsi. Yeah, we'll go with that. And Robert Orsi. And it was directed by Alex Graves. J.J. Abrams produced a short called Shrek I Feel Good. Alex Kurtzman (laughs) was the executive producer of... Of some show that no one's ever heard of or worked on called uh, let me check my notes here uh, Star Trek Picard Star, Star Trek Picard. I think it was Star Wars or something <laughs> no yes that wrong? Uh, okay. Robert Orsi was the executive producer of Limitless for the amount of times I've made that joke about people <laughs> taking the Limitless pill I owe him let's see here, four cents in residuals <laughs> uh, f- uh, 47 cents yeah, right. and Alex Graves directed the season 2 finale of The Boys which is some fantastic directing and I'm not not gonna drag him for that so well done alex i mean he's done a lot of like prestige tv shows episodes i was like he did a ton of homeland didn't he like first and second season yeah something like that i mean like alex graves is yeah he's yeah he works yeah yeah. So yeah, so because this is a 90 minute pilot and we don't want to be doing a two hour episode here, we're not going to do our typical scene by scene breakdown. What we're going to do first, uh, first off, we're going to just talk about the fringe pilot versus the lost pilot. Yeah. The reason we selected the fringe is because there's the J.J. Abrams connection, obviously. Right. But these are two excellent pilots, right? Holy shit, yeah. Yeah. The Lost Pilot is, uh, at least between the three of us, we all agree it's a really great pilot. Yes. It's like, here, here are a bunch of fish hooks. Gobble down, you hungry, hungry. <laughs> There's so many fucking fish hooks in this one. Yeah, Jeez, and, and this crazy. one's exactly the same. Exactly. Yeah, they, they just throw up like all these storylines and every single one of them's got a little morsel at the end of it, which is wonderful. Yeah. There's one big easy parallel is this was a $10 million pilot. Oh, really? <laughs> yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> Holy shit. One of the most expensive pilots in a long time. Yeah, like Lost, I think Lost was a $10 million pilot and that was the most expensive pilot at the time. So then four years later here- they do another $10 million pilot. Which is crazy, because that pilot crashed that plane, and then this <laughs> pilot died, and they had to use the autopilot. That was the secret. Just put it on autopilot, and the right. lost would have been fine. <laughs> <laughs> There's another, I don't know, obvious Lost connection in the pilot. In the first several minutes of the show, they play a Lost track as the plane is like <laughs> crashing. Mm. Like, I don't know if you guys heard it. I didn't notice that. Wait, what do you mean a Lost track? Like- There's like, the, the music is from Lost. <laughs> According to the trivia, it's probably like just a scratch track, like a temp track that they were like, we'll sure. put some real music in here later. Let's just, And Michael Giacchino is just like, yeah, we'll use the I have this file for now. And then they just never replaced <laughs> it. Just it just comes with avid like <laughs> just yeah so they just left this scratch track of the of the literal lost soundtrack in the first scene where the plane is yeah where everybody's turning yeah. the goo and, and crashing and all that but yeah there's a big kicking off with this plane crash just like in lost jj abrams hates planes where was he on 9 11 <laughs> Where was he when the Malaysian flight went missing? <laughs> Is he really into trains? 
And uh, again, a 90 minute pilot, two parter. This aired all one night, just like the just like the lost pilot, two parts yeah. in the same night. It did not feel like 90 minutes. No, flew I was by. Just yeah. Enjoying every fucking minute of this. <laughs> yeah. Mm-hmm. Big. I, th- I would say a big difference from the lost pilot to the fringe pilot is the fringe pilot. I think went out of its way, and I think it was easier because it's set in just like in Boston, in not right. on a tropical island. They went out of their way to have several big sort of action set pieces. There were at least two like decent sized action sequences and then like two like smaller ones yeah and i think that that is that's an easy way to get people to pay attention to what they're looking at even if it doesn't bring them back for next time like it keeps their eyes on the screen right the thing that i initially started doing was yeah just like you said like comparing this to the lost pilot you can see all of the course correction that they made in yeah. terms of like, we understand how to get hooks in people. Lost took a minute to do it. You know, it's not really until walkabout, I think, that people were really fucking like, wait, yeah. what is this show? Mm-hmm. Whereas this one, everything's coming at you so fast. And it's like, yeah, okay, we're, we're stranded on an island. Yeah, that's mysterious. Now we need shit for these people to do. <laughs> you yeah. know what I mean? So setting it like in the real world and just making... The world under the world mysterious makes writing so much easier. Yeah. And way simpler because they had the basic premise of the monster of the week or the crazy science project of like the week Mm, for them to go back to the well of every episode. Yeah. Right. I I don't know. I think it was on Fox. There was um, like a Sleepy Hollow show. Yeah. I actually really enjoyed it just because the the two three seasons lean actors were they they had good chemistry. But it is like a dumbed down version exactly of Fringe where they're like, oh, we got it was actually uh, uh, it was Clancy Brown. It's Clancy (laughs) Brown's like (laughs) notes. And every week there's a different monster. They got to go to it. And it's like the same thing with Fringe. Like, oh, shit, we got to go back to the doctor's notes because he worked on this project back in the 70s and it's I fucking love Monster of the Week, man. It's so much fun. And and the cool thing here is too, because again, this is JJ, and so and he was involved in the Lost Pilot. He helped develop Jeffrey Lieber's idea into yeah. what we, uh, we what ended up being broadcast. So you can not only see the 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 bones of Lost here, but then you can very clearly see the skeleton uh that is the x files as well with the monster oh, of the totally. week type of thing yeah i was i was talking to a uh, former guest of the show kimberly davister just earlier today and she kimberly whatever <laughs> <laughs> kim i was talking to a f- former guest of the show kim davister earlier and um i was t- i told her we were watching fringe and she was like oh i never saw that no you kind of just i subscribed to her i was like it's kind of like x files but set in a post 9 11 world yeah that's a really good way of putting that right and, th- and that was then another thing Thing that I talked to her too, uh, talked to her about too, is um, the post 9 ness of the show. At, in the first few minutes, we g- get the heavy presence of Department of Homeland Security. Philip Boyle's yeah. walking. Terrorist act. Yeah. Terrorist act. Everybody jump on there. Millions of oh, cops yeah, everywhere. Yeah. yeah. The the little bit of like, it's, it's not even really drawn attention to. Like, we had to burn the plane just on the runway. Like, yeah. we don't know what this is. We're terrified of it. Burn the goddamn plane. I was like, oh my god. Yeah. 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 <laughs> This, they get the CDC, they get the FBI, they get the. There's a CIA agent there, and they're all operating under this big joint umbrella of Department of Homeland Security. Yeah, which is wild. It's a, yeah, it's like the type of thing you would imagine would not have happened in if this show was set in 1998. No, <laughs> during during the X Files time, you know, like it would have been like a beat cop. <laughs> <laughs> it would have been Mulder and Scully, and yeah, one Boston police detective. <laughs> yeah, it'd be Angela Lansbury and the one cop that lives on the island with her. I forget his name. <laughs> yeah. Cabot Cove, the highest per capita murder rate in the country. <laughs> yeah, like in the world. Um, not to, uh, you know, uh, you you weren't here for our conversation last episode, Haas, where we talked about the Heroes pilot. Mm-hmm. As I was watching this, rather than comparing it to Lost, because the, the similarities and how they sort of refined their mystery box process was very clear, mm-hmm. just at, like, you know, how much more polished this feels, I was thinking about directly, like, how much better this was than the Heroes pilot. Right. <laughs> and on so many fucking levels, I kept comparing it to what we had watched last time, and it just blew my fucking mind. That these came out around the same time, you know, the yeah. same general. Yeah, I think, I think Heroes came out the year before Fringe did, right. 2007, right? Yeah. And right. yeah, this is like a very stark example of like, Heroes is like, how you don't do a pilot. Yeah. <laughs> and Fringe is how you do a pilot. 
Absolutely. Um, Just in terms of like quality of actors and some of the lines oh are great yeah. and they're acting their fucking pants off. Yeah. And it's just, it's so good. Which is a good segue into, I think, the next thing we should touch upon, which is the, the cast and the oh. relationships that exist within within Fringe. A big a big tick in the plus column for Fringe versus Lost. This is a smaller cast size. Yes. You got, ma- you got, you got, main, <laughs> yeah. you got main characters, half, half of what the Lost does. And now, granted, everybody on Lost, we love, uh, except Claire, I guess, and Charlie. <laughs> Jack, and Kate. Kate, Sawyer, most Nikki, of the time. So we love, G- we, so we love Hurley, Jin, and Son, and everybody else is there. Um, <laughs> but here we've got Agent Dunham, Agent Francis, Agent Broyles, and we got Peter and Walter, and that's about it. Yeah, everybody, everybody else, is, else everybody is else like, is kind of recurring. Like mm-hmm. he, yeah, yeah. Astrid, Agent Agent Farnsworth is there. Nina Sharp, and then uh, John Scott, obviously he's dead in the pilot, right? Or is uh, he? Can I just <laughs> say I had no idea Lance Reddick was in this. And Ooh. I shit my pants when he <laughs> came on screen. Uh, his voice is so oh. awesome. Um, his, uh, sadly, recently passed. Uh, yes, Lance Reddick, such a cool, uh, cool actor, and does such a wonderful job as Philip Royals throughout this show. Yeah. Like, mm-hmm. really, really good. We won't talk about it because we're we're not talking about episode two or the future of Fringe or anything like that. But like he he does a really good job of establishing Philip Broyles as this hard ass kind of creep. Yeah. yeah, like I forgot how much he can. He started as an asshole yeah, in this. I was right. like, damn. Oh, okay. Yeah, like. <laughs> Even including when Livy's like, "Hey, your your buddy is a sexual assaulter guy, and I got him in trouble." And he's like, well, "You made one mistake." It's like, "Ew, dude." <laughs> and then she says uh, three times. You know, like, <laughs> yeah, yeah. And yeah, I wrote that in my notes. I was like, "Oh no, Broyles is a, Broyles defends sexual assault. Gross, buddy." <laughs> yeah. But all of the all of the like cliche. I'm the hard sergeant, you yeah. broad. You know, like. <laughs> He is always like, I don't fucking like you, but if you come back here with something and it's real, I will listen. Right. So yeah. go to go to work. Why are you talking to me? Right. You know, and I like that sort of dynamic where he's like, I hate your guts. You're doing a really good job. <laughs> <laughs> so, yeah, he, he's great. Um, and Anna Torv playing uh, Agent uh, Olivia she's Dunham. She's fantastic. She, uh, she's Australian. I don't know if you guys knew that. Um, mm-hmm. I wish she was doing an Australian accent because when I hear her speak in her normal voice, that's like the only time I find the Australian accent even like remotely palatable. And I'm just like, yeah, tell me everything that you have to say. <laughs> yeah. Oh, she's a mind hunter. She's awesome. Oh, yeah. 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 So good at mind hunter. Um, yeah. Yeah. She's easy on the eyes. I'll drink all that salt water she was laying in. <laughs> Anyways. Uh... <laughs> Um, Joshua Jackson as Peter Bishop. It's fucking from Mighty Ducks to this. Man. That's right. That's right. Charlie Conway, number ninety nine. Just charm in a pea coat. He's so like he's so smart. He's I, I wrote in my notes that he is an arrogant know it all. But despite that, he's incredibly charming. And this is he again, says sweetheart and darling every time he oh, talks to Anna, which is so sickening. <laughs> um, but it does a thing where it does. I think what they wanted to do with Sawyer. You know, sure. He's a bad boy. You can't tie him down. He's going to say what he thinks and he's whatever. And it's like, but very quickly in the following episode, you know, they start to sand him down again and you find out, you know, okay, he's a real human too, beyond the charm and charm and the smarm and the arrogance. He's a real dude. His IMDb, I mean, he's been in a bunch of stuff, but not like, not a ton, you know what I mean? Like, or, or his roles are very like tertiary, um, but in in this pilot, I thought his performance was pretty solid. Yeah, yeah. I want to say this was like one of his first big things since like the Creek. You know, like yeah, <laughs> the Creek probably was. Yeah, bust him out of that role of the teeny yeah, the yeah. teen heart CW yeah, 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 soapy stuff. Yeah, John Noble as oh. Walter Bishop can't get any better than that. Talk about a guy, another guy with a great voice, unreal. Oh yeah, like him, Lance Reddick in the same room. If like the two of them are ever arguing, like I don't know if they ever have a scene together, really. But like they have to. <laughs> but yeah, like <laughs> so good. No, um, I mean he's you got to have the the quirky personality, right? That ties all this shit together yeah. and makes it fun to watch. Yeah, the mad scientist. Yep. Yeah. yeah, the mad scientist who like he knows the science. His mind is fractured, but he really has a heart of gold. And mm-hmm. it's like ah, he's so 
I, I just his thing about like thank you for trusting me yeah i was like yeah. oh my god this poor old man he's just let him do his weird science <laughs> Just let him experiment. He can experiment on me. Yeah, right? be fine. yeah, yeah. I'll, just so he has something to do. Get him out of the house. Yeah, yeah. When he de- <laughs> when he delivers that line, well, yeah. When Livy's about to go into the tank, he's like, "Thank you for getting me out of that place. You you lose being trusted. It's strange how important that is once it's gone." Yeah, and it's little lines like that that not only are interesting to the show and tell you a lot about Walter himself, but then they already also start to do um, the relationship building that we need because you you can tell even then he's not only just talking about having been stuck in St. Clair. He's talking about his relationship with his son. Yeah, that's a, like that was the thing versus the the heroes pilot where I'm like each one of these people I get their strengths, their weaknesses, how they relate to one another. Whereas heroes, I was just like, who the fuck are these people? <laughs> <laughs> Speaking of who are these people in the in the first scene where John and Livy are in the motel room together, they never say one another's names. Mm-hmm. However, they both answer the phone, which gives them an excuse to say their name out loud for the audience. So it yes. doesn't happen immediately. It's not like, oh, John, that was so good. <laughs> oh, Livy, mm. they talk a little bit. It's like, okay, what, who are these people? And then. Olivia Dunham, Agent Scott. It's like, okay, here we go. That's pretty, you know, that's And then in the immediate next scene, they need to pretend like they don't know each other and they say each other's (laughs) names again. It's like, here's for all you people that missed it because they're hot. Yeah. (laughs) Exactly. But yeah, like uh, they do. I, I think this pilot does a good, a really good job of doing these little like they, they get in and sometimes, you know, sometimes you can. It's a little cliche or whatever. Like Charlie just kind of slipping into a conversation where he's like, I knew John. I've known John just as long as you. And it's like you, you pepper that stuff in because it's a pilot, but you get the impression. Yeah. It's like, OK, John. OK, John and Livy obviously care for each other. But Charlie is a friend of theirs and has been for a long time. We get that quickly. And then you also get Kirk Acevedo uh, playing Charlie Francis. Yeah. doing go- a good job of acting like Livy's friend. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I never once got the idea that he had some sort of romantic relationship or romantic feelings for her. This is very much a platonic, both a platonic and a professional relationship. He liked her as a friend and he liked and he liked working with her as a professional and it didn't have to go any further than that. And so we're not worried about some sort of doofy love triangle or anything like that. Right. It's like, oh, John Scott, oh, Charlie Francis, or whatever. It's like, no, this is her friend. This is her boss. John's also his friend. It's all like... We got it. Very cool. Yeah. Is that how you say his name? I think so. Acevedo? Well, how did you say it? Acevedo? All right. I had never considered how you say that. I was just assumed it was Acevedo. Acevedo? It might be Acevedo. Acevedo. I don't don't think I've ever heard it said out loud, so I'm like... Oh. I've only ever seen it written in the credits of like yeah. a thousand TV shows <laughs> and movies. <laughs> There's a couple other minor uh, recurring characters that we find. Um, Agent Astrid Farnsworth, who she, because Walter needs things re-explained to him constantly, she tells him exactly who he's yeah. like, who are you? Do you work here? He's like, I'm Astrid Farnsworth. I am Livy's assistant. I believe I told you this, and I will tell you this in every episode. Yeah. Including her own name. <laughs> It's different. I love that. It's so good. Yeah, Astrid is such a wonderful name. And uh, uh, Jessica Nicole, I believe, is the actress. Uh, again, another, a little recurring character, just like she's not going to be like a huge part of it, but she's part of, you know, if you don't have that character there, then all of a sudden it's like, okay, a small cast is maybe too small. Right. Do we believe that it's just these three people in this lab all the time? Nobody's watching the cow. <laughs> yeah, what's the... <laughs> Do we get an answer about the cow? Does the cow, re- like, come back up? The cow, oh, yeah. The, the cow, cow plays. plays. Yeah. The cow plays all the time. Pa- pa- really? Or, or Peter, yeah. sa- Peter says why he needs a cow. Uh, cows are only genetically, the DNA is only a few lines different than humans, so it's an ethical right. test subject. I don't know if that's true or not. I don't but... know if it's true either, but that's what Peter says, and that's yeah, why the cow's, the cow's there. <laughs> the cow's there often. I mean, it's uh, it, the cow is always there, yeah. but they, yeah. like, include it in the story, and yeah. it's a, usually, like, it's an aside. It's not a main yeah, point, because like this is fringe, not one cow one science. Shot. Yeah, it's, like, in there. It's like, okay, he's here in one shot to establish that we didn't forget about the cow, and... <laughs> That's Gene. fucking funny. <laughs> and the cow's name is Gene, which I only just now realize is like Gene, genetic. Yeah. Oh, yeah. I didn't get that either. I didn't yeah. get that till just today. I, was like, yeah, I just thought, it's oh, funny. a funny, like, old yeah. person name yeah, or something. Just, yeah, just, you know. yeah. But that's what oh, I nice. mean in terms of, like, all right, we have, we, we live in a world and a civilization where we can, like, hide all of these things that might have meaning as opposed to like all right when we're stranded on a jungle island everything we show has to have meaning so everything is mm-hmm. going to be very much scrutinized because there shouldn't be anything here so whenever there's anything it's like what does it mean what is this whereas this the, like on fringe you had to like you constantly had to be looking at the whole frame yeah to be like what's hidden right because all of this looks normal so what am i missing right 
What what is what is hiding in plain sight? Is there a right. recurring character that appears in every episode that I always want to be on the lookout for because he's just one more piece of the puzzle? Yes, maybe. Is that wait? Was that Fringe? Is that the guy in the hat? Yeah, the Observer. Okay, another yeah. another recurring character that if you don't keep your eye out for him, he's very easy to miss. Sometimes, mm-hmm. sometimes he's very obvious. There, and yeah. he actually features in episodes where he's a character himself. He has lines and everything. Played by Michael Cerveris, the um, well-known Broadway actor who revived Sweeney Todd, and then went on to be in Mindhunter with Anna Torf. Okay. Was he in this episode? He was. He I was. missed it. It's and this is one that's very easy to miss. Um, he's just he's uh. He's walking on the sidewalk in front of Massive Dynamic the first time we see it. Oh, yeah. Well, there you go. A show that knows what they're doing in the pilot. Setting <laughs> things in. Holy shit. Little right tiny thing. Beginning. Walk past. And it's a huge part of the show. Yeah. And and he's wearing a hat. And it's kind of like just like in the foreground. So he's like, again, yeah, very easy to Blends miss. But right they were like, this is a thing we want to do from the jump. So let's put him in there. Yeah. And then like anybody watching the show is not going to notice that. No, they're just like, oh, it's a yeah. weird background dress guy. Right. It's not until you go back. Once you recognize it, then you got to go back. I can watch all the other ones like where was he what was he doing mm-hmm, what, what mm-hmm. was the timestamp? like when they found out or whoever it was that broke the code of you know the the cipher the yep. cipher yep. in the show yep. Yep. what did you even notice that jp or do you know of the cipher no like at the before they go into the commercial break there's always that flash of like right. a weird looking like image like the five like fingered hand or, or a, yeah a six fingered hand or a leaf or a, a moth or whatever an yeah. apple yeah. with the embryos and right that stood for a letter that then spelled out something that it usually had to do with the episode like this one for the pilot it was observer, observer. Yeah. and they were able to do a long word like observer because it was a two-hour pilot they had extra commercial breaks generally the ciphers were always like a five or six letter word because they were always an hour runtime they had five commercial breaks to do them in really mm-hmm. so like okay. as you watch the episode if you were really into it you'd be like figuring out what all the letters mean yeah. and then try to break down and like break the code before the episode finishes if you wanted or save it to the end because not only was it a, an image but then there was a light on each image and so like the you could have flare. yeah the like so an apple depending on where the flare was might mean two different letters if the flare was in the upper left it would be a and if it was in the lower right it might mean f and so similar images and it, yeah like again it sort of like an easter egg type of thing mm-hmm. really like the world sure. building that they did extended beyond just the frame of television it also extended into just the... that like one second before you go to the commercial yeah yeah amazing. yeah yeah jj abrams put all these ciphers in television <laughs> people think it's so much fun but when i was on all these first dates and i was like here you go random woman solve the zodiac cipher <laughs> she's like Ew, what are you doing in my house <laughs> You know, I need to leave. Whatever. Oh, what's that, Mom? My phone's ringing. I gotta go. <laughs> oh, Lordy. Um, and then I think the only other character that we got a little bit of a taste of was, was Nina Sharp, the massive dynamic chief executive, something or other. The, the comically villain woman. <laughs> <laughs> Who is a barrier to entry to getting to know the mysterious William Bell, um, Walter's former partner at the lab back back in the 70s, back during Vietnam. Back when you could get the good ketamine. <laughs> <laughs> back when you didn't have to like try to get LSD. <laughs> right. You have to make it yourself. Yeah, they just do. stumbled in down the like the basement stairs from Harvard and be like, yep. hey guys. Right. That's all like there's a whole breaking bad spin-off to this where <laughs> it's just like that's the LSD uh economy that follows around the Grateful Dead. <laughs> I mean you gotta support this somehow. <laughs> exactly. So yeah. Cool, uh, cool cast, cool. Not only did we see a lot of like world building in the mystery that they're trying to solve throughout the show, we see world building in the characters and their relationships and how, like, who they're trying to get a hold of, what they're interacting with, Department of Homeland Security, Massive Dynamic, Harvard, and then the people attached to all these things. So the world building, the relationships that we're getting to know are just as much a part of the world building as all of the mystery of the week kind of stuff. Sure. And and they're just and they just do such a such a good jo- good job throughout, including. The big twist at the end of the episode. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Which is you spend this whole time watching our hero trying to save the life of John Scott, her paramour, her her dude. And then once we get him back on his feet, turns out he's a big murdering murderer. <laughs> yeah. Not a very nice guy. <laughs> and uh, and that's just another little fish hook. <laughs> like, yeah. We spent an hour cheering for this guy to get better. And then the last 20 minutes, we're like, what the fuck, man? <laughs> Like What's he was alive, he's gonna make it. He's great, and then killed over, died in her arms. So what the fuck? Why, From why did blood we... force trauma to the brain. Yeah, why do we even fucking care? Did we just waste our time? That's how I felt about Kennedy. Uh... 
but that's that's sort of like our mystery of the week thing. Even within, even while they're setting up what the future is going to be with the pattern and the and, and, and master dynamic and all this stuff, it's like we still got a mystery of the week to solve here, and that's who is the actual bad guy. Well, it turns out it's Special Agent Scott. Right. Haas, I'm, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. So, like, lots of sci-fi shows that I grew up watching, Star Trek Next Generation, so much of that is Planet of the Week. Stargate SG-1, Planet of the Week. You know, all these shows. Star Trek, not as much, but, like, Stargate, for me, I really fell off off of because once it got away from like the planet of the week and just got into the like the overarching story of like the big bad and week after week after week it was just like okay we've kind of lost what I liked about the show in terms of fringe being like the case of the week the disease of the week the science of the week like did they maintain that pretty well through the show to your recollection or did it get pretty heavy into the the mythology early on towards the end it got into more of the overarching uh narrative more than just monster of the week that was like sure. first season kind of stuff because there was some things that kind of broke the show open to then need to focus on the overarching stuff later on okay which i was so invested in it i really liked it but i there's a part of me that missed some of that monster of the week too there's a little bit that definitely had it was a smaller piece of a larger puzzle sort of they had to fix got it yeah because this is i could see myself watching this for quite a while too i felt the same way about the prisoner where i'm just like fuck yeah i'm gonna check some of this out but as soon as it starts to deviate from how the pilot made me feel and they're like not as monster of the week i know i'm just gonna dip right out <laughs> I, I would say yeah i got you i'm, I'm with you but that's because i have the attention span of a springer spaniel so <laughs> Well, maybe you'd be interested because, like I said, there are there there's something that happens because they never totally get rid of it. They never totally get rid of the the monster that we no. think until about like maybe like that short in season five where it was like now it's sort time of, yeah. to wrap up four mm-hmm. years worth of storylines and we're going to use these thirteen episodes to do that. Yeah, but like the yeah, um, I've only ever seen up through the first few episodes of season two. Yeah, like you said, Haas, there's an event that happens very near to the end of season one that kind of busts the busts the world open. It's like we spent twenty something odd weeks showing how strange the world of fringe is but that's really only a precursor to what's you know we're what we're seeing is symptoms and then now we're gonna the see pattern that yeah, they talked about exactly yeah and so and, and but then even though then as season two begins it's like the season two premiere is kind of, it's it parallels the the pilot in a way because like there's an event and they still got to solve it yeah it's now tied to the pattern much more clearly but you know so yeah yeah, I don't know. I'd recommend it. Give it a diff and a recommend, especially if you're into sci-fi. Love Fringe. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think this, again, there's, there's, I don't want to beat this point over that, but everything about this pilot works. Yeah. And you can just see how well-oiled the machine is in terms of the writing mm-hmm. um, and setting things up. And it's just like, oh, yeah, it's not just, oh, they're on an island. How do they get off the <laughs> island? That's going to be weird oh there's some smoke <laughs> that's weird every act of this had like four different hooks where i'm like i gotta know more about this weird science shit that's going on <laughs> and and one of the things that i think works so well in the fringe pilot is i already mentioned the, how much world building they do throughout the world of fringe is 90 percent our world unlike the lost island their world building is uh, it's a blank canvas they're like we're on an island and you don't know anything about this island yeah, trees are still green you know that but right halfway through it they're like a polar bear tropical island and it's like okay you're you're building a world and it already doesn't make sense whereas the world of fringe makes sense to us for the most part we're all familiar with right you know we're all familiar with what the federal government was like post 9-11 the expansion of the department of homeland security how they got involved in everything you know as far as law enforcement domestically blah 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 blah. we we were all familiar with that 90 percent of our world is built for us just look around this 10 percent though this is where we're really gonna make that's how we're going to make the difference. And this 10% of the world that we're going to build on top of the 90% that's already real, that's going to make, that's that's just going to be more hooks. Exactly. Like sometimes our world building is just a hook. Yeah. It's like, you know, we got a mystery. What is the pattern? We got a mystery. Why don't we, why, who is Walter Bell? Part of the mystery, another hook is just what other weird stuff can happen in a world so similar to our own. Well, and it's not too far from the truth. When you look at like the MK Ultra program mm-hmm. or you talk about about things like Operation Paperclip and all these yep. like mm-hmm. things that yeah we have an idea of what they did because parts of it have become declassified but we 
don't know a lot about it. And we know yeah. that things like this happen within our government where there's these insane, you know, projects where it's like, I don't know, let's see if we can fucking mind control or stick somebody up their own right. ass. Like, yeah, exactly. <laughs> it's like if we give somebody enough ketamine and acid, can they dream with a person who's dead? <laughs> like, I don't know, but I'm willing to find out. <laughs> right, exactly. And, and just stick me in the tank. Let's go. <laughs> let's go. Oh, um, thing in the, my brain. <laughs> the, the ending, how long has he been dead? Six hours. Hours. good interrogation question oh yeah. yes <laughs> let's yep. fucking go that's that crazy creepy shit and i love it and they get a lot of mileage not only not only as far as like mysteries world building but they get they they do they take stuff like mk ultra and they get they get comedy out of it in later yeah. episodes like they do joke like walter's like always doing jokes like yeah man i remember when the dod came to me when vietnam was happening they're like hey do you think we can make marines fly like let's make yeah. let's give people webbed toes like yeah yeah. And, he, and he's like, and so I tried it, you know. <laughs> yeah. We had some mild success. <laughs> yeah. Everything you did was like a mild success with unintended consequences. And that's why there's a fish man. <laughs> right. Well, and, and I love the idea of like, if you if you really think about the timeline where it's like, oh, I did this for five years for the government. I'm like, mm -hmm. okay, now how many experiments did you have? Dude, you you came up with some insane shit every ten days. Yeah. Every time you had a quarterly update with your like senior <laughs> vice president, it was just like, wait, you did what now? I oh, I made a the, last time I we were talking about the fish man. man. Yeah, I'm making an eight man in there. <laughs> Did you just sew more arms onto that man's costume? <laughs> I'm high on mescaline. <laughs> God. But that's the, that's another thing that I love about the show, and we we get a little bit of it in the in the pilot, not a ton, because it's very this the the pilot is very action packed and very very. Yeah. Uh, we get a lot of exposition that is cleverly masked as just the this, this script, you know, like it, it's exposition without being boring. And, and then it's bookended by these set pieces. But the show's funny. Like, yeah, <laughs> Walter is the most hilarious yeah not so funny character good. of all time yeah and like and and the odd couple dynamic he has with peter yeah and, and just and and just sort of you know you're you're charlie francis whenever he walks in and he's just like i clearly don't understand what's happening here um is that a cow like yeah <laughs> That's yeah, Gene. Don't worry about it. It's just Gene. It's not what we it's do. It's fine. Just, but, um, why are you talking about all shit? <laughs> but yeah, like, that. I mean, like, the, the show's funny. And it's, you know, kind of like, you know, here on Lost on Lost, how we make fun of 9-11 uh, all the time. Um, they take some serious <laughs> shit and make fun of it. Because that's yeah. how you cope. You, if you made a serious show, like if Fringe was a, a serious drama about the effects of the military industrial complex and MK Ultra and Vietnam and the blurring of lines between the government and corporations, well, I can just fucking read Twitter if I want to be sad. <laughs> I can just look out my real window of my house. <laughs> right. Just read the news. Yeah. Yeah. And that was a line that later on I, I made a note of, uh, Charlie says, as... Um, as he's trying to, as after the after the big car chase and everything, like Charlie's trying to talk to Livy after seeing John die, and he says, "How do we protect people when corporations have higher security clearances than we have?" Because earlier in the episode, Nina Sharp was aware of something that Olivia wasn't, and it's like the show again doing sort of a, a comment on post nine eleven world. It's like not only were we talking about government and an overreach and all that stuff, we're also talking about how big corporations just continue to swell and take over our entire yeah. lives. They drive past a billboard, massive dynamic. What don't we do? Yeah. <laughs> just a friendly kid, a little uh, paper airplane. Yeah. That morphs into a fucking F-16 fighter jet or whatever. I wish I could fucking do that. And that's just another um, another thing that I enjoyed about it was that it's a comment about what life what life was transforming into, especially in the fucking dog days of the Iraq occupation <sighs> and what life has continued to become here in 20 in the 2020s. You know, yeah, I think as we do this and we learn more about the mystery box, I, I don't want to say that, you know, I hate giving J.J. Abrams credit because uh, <laughs> he's. He's not my favorite writer. He's not my favorite director. He's not my favorite personality in Hollywood. But you see how successful Lost was. You know, off, yeah. off. You know, we we saw the prisoner. You know, you see the the beginning stages of you know what what makes a Lost or an X Files or a Twin Peaks or whatever. 
Yeah. You see Lost, clearly learned a lot. You got something like this. Every major show now follows this same format, whether they are truly a mystery box or not. All of the big shows do this, where you're creating a big question, a bunch of small questions, and you're very quickly establishing the, like, why we want you to watch our centric characters. And and it follows the same thing. We're going to give you just enough breadcrumbs to keep keep you watching for as many seasons as we get funding for this show. Yeah. And it I, I think it really started with a mystery box and now we're in this incredible era of prestige television and it's just, yep, we know exactly how to write a pilot. You just do it like this. Right. Exactly. Look at you, you need, so far here on Lost and Lost the Lost Effect, you can look you need to look at four things. You need to look at the prisoner, you need to look at Lost itself, you need to look at heroes, you need to look at fringe. Those four things will tell you exactly what you need to do and exactly what you shouldn't do. Yeah. And if you want to make a if you want to make a, a genre mystery box, the answers are all there. Right. I mean, but uh, Breaking Bad follows the same formula. Ozark follows the same formula. Yeah. Stranger yeah. Things follows the same formula. Uh, yeah. Yellow Jackets follows the same formula. <laughs> yeah, exactly. It doesn't even necessarily have to be a, a genre or a you know thing like yeah, like Breaking Bad or like the um, and then it by extension Better Call Saul. Those are just they're they're a crime drama and a legal drama. Yeah, <laughs> and and there's shows too that they learn from that that we're not going to talk about here, but I'm sure you know they've used. It's all it interweaves. Uh, smart writers, smart television directors, smart developers. They look at success and not only what is successful, what is not successful, and that's how you make good stuff. The people who try to do their own thing without learning from the past, well, that's how you end up with heroes. <laughs> <laughs> And even him, even Tim Kring, who created Heroes, went on to work and develop more stuff. And you could even see if you watched some of the stuff he developed after he did Fringe or after he did Heroes, you could see how the things he learned, maybe not still successful because I think Touch only did two seasons. But like he's at, you know, I don't know. Nah, fuck that. Don't learn from other people's mistakes and don't learn from other people's successes. Do it your own way like this <laughs> podcast. Who else is watching this shit out of order? Nobody. And that's why we've got tens of listeners. Literally no, literally nobody's doing this. <laughs> <laughs> I wonder why. Not only is nobody doing, nobody would in the middle of an established format do 10 episodes <laughs> of totally not that format just because they can. <laughs> That's some crazy shit right there. Corporations don't own us, baby. They can get fucked. That's right. That's right. We're fucking unpredictable. We're going beyond becoming ungovernable. We're working on being coming unobservable. <laughs> Unknown you variables. Guys, you guys are on too much ketamine and LSD. <laughs> and you're here with us, Haas. Don't don't sit over there in your fucking ivory tower. <laughs> Uh, let's talk real quick about the action of the show. Um, yeah. There were two. There were two big set pieces. There was a big car chase at the end with Livy and John uh, in yeah, the car. Tuned out, to be honest, on that one. Uh, the, the, but then I kind of forgot about the, the the sort of small foot chase that happens right after they're trying to get uh, uh, Richard Steak. Oh yeah, yeah, the Jason Bourne, Jason thing. Bourne moment. <laughs> yeah, falling down scaffold or not scaffolding, Dude, fire escape, fire escape, on dumpsters and. Fucking Peter Jackson just, just punch it out a guy. That was unreal, man. Like, um, <laughs> like, yeah. They, Joshua they, Jackson. When I say Peter Jackson. You said Peter Jackson. <laughs> um, that like just kind of out in the middle of nowhere. They go into the like they they get the location. Like we're gonna go nail this guy. They go in there. The place is abandoned. Whatever. Yeah. Walter and and Peter are in the car arguing about something. Yeah. They're actually kind of sort of having like they're rekindling and rebuilding their relationship, having not seen each other for almost twenty years. Um, but then they Peter spots the guy and goes chasing after him. And so you have a two pronged chase. First, Livy is chasing this dude across the roof, and then they both <laughs> jump off the roof onto a fire escape 10 15 feet and then another 20 off of that to the ground <laughs> dude i foot chase scenes always bore the hell out of me unless it's the one from black dynamite um, <laughs> but what she was just like I, it, it really helps establish she's not just like I'm a field agent because I'm really good with computers. She's like, no, nah, I'm gonna fuck this guy right. up. <laughs> like, no, yeah, no hesitation when she went over the. She didn't like get to the edge, take a couple no. steps back, and then take a running jump. Just like in stride over the edge. Yeah. So good. Yeah, and this action does a great job of establishing more of Livy's skill set. Yeah, she's willing to chase a guy down. She's willing to draw a pistol. She's willing to whatever. And then also in the same thing, we get a thing here where Peter he sort of ceases being a bystander in the story and uh, becomes an active participant in stopping crime <laughs> right <laughs> outside like, the law stopping the crime yeah exactly yeah. this vigilante fucking guy nice to give him something to do 
Yeah, because yeah, because he does spend most of the episode up until that point just kind of like following people around, complaining that he he's being coerced into doing all this stuff. But then he gets in the game, you know, and it does obviously establish some more relationship stuff there. He you know is already starting to feel protective of Olivia. Yeah, despite the fact that she said, "I have a boyfriend." <laughs> So yeah, um, so there was that, and then the 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 opening scene is not necessarily big big action because it's all in one location, but it is yeah that plane crash, and the most stunning part about that is not even necessarily the action and the tension in it, but then it's the special effects, all those people turning into yeah. the goo. Yeah, I watched that while uh, having breakfast this morning. <laughs> <laughs> not the most advisable. <laughs> With somebody next to me that hadn't watched it at all and wasn't didn't know what she was in for. Oh, boys. And she was not pleased with me. But you I was like, took mm, your egg sorry. whites and threw them right in the fucking trash. <laughs> it's a good show, I promise. Let me go toast. Yeah. Fuck. <laughs> the jelly no, looks like these people. No now. jelly, no <laughs> butter. No! Oh, and even the, the dream sequence where yeah. Yeah, they're like mind melding. I was like, oh, this, this looks like they actually tried. They tried yeah. harder on that than they did the, the graphics that like... <laughs> <laughs> I'm like, come on. I know this is 2008, but like, I can make that shit on my laptop in like 10 minutes. Do sure. better. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Like I said at the top, $10 million. And you can see where they spent it. Yeah. They did this big car chase. They did the special effects, not only in the airplane on all the on the, all the background in there, but then the body effects that went on to John Scott yeah. after he'd been slimed. Mm-hmm. The foot chase in the apartment building. And yeah. They took the 40 bucks they had left over and did some CG by doing the <laughs> dreamscape and putting all the fun Chirons in 3D over Baghdad yeah. and Boston and all this stuff. Like that was another style thing that I just always loved about Fringe was that whenever instead of it just being a typeface at yeah. the bottom of the screen it's all like Harvard University and it's in 3D in, it was unique from yeah. I don't think anything else has ever done a look like that for a it was just so cool location. establishing the style of the show setting it apart even more so yeah. along with the 50 million light lens flares <laughs> yeah <laughs> well, JJ gonna JJ even though he's not directing he's got a JJ <laughs> <laughs> He's watching the dailies and goes, Do you guys even have any fucking lights on set or what? All right. Glad we got a million dollars in our budget for lens flares. So yeah. in there. JJ. <laughs> that man, he hates planes, loves trains, and he loves flashing flashlights in people's eyes. Is JJ Abrams autistic? Uh <laughs> <laughs> and he loves spending $10 million in Toronto, a place where television is supposed to be hypothetically cheaper to shoot. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, you get actual tax incentives. Yeah. Well, but um, oh, my favorite piece of trivia about the pilot beyond all the cool shit that happened was when they shot the pilot, it was like 10 of the coldest days Toronto had ever oh, seen. Oh, really? It was like wow. they were doing outdoor stuff at like 30 below. Like the scene like Ow. the scene of them like leaving St. Clair's, like walking from the car like, building to the car. Yeah, they were like, it was like a 25 below wind chill that day. Like, the special effects so bad for that crew. Oh, it's so funny. Is that <laughs> accurate that they shot this in 10 days? Uh, no, it was probably 20 or something like that. Like, oh, I was going to say, because, like, it there's it looks pretty good. But like, they probably spent 10 of that, maybe 15 of it outside, depending on, you know. Right. Oh, I get what you're saying. Sure, sure, sure. Yeah, because the, the lighting in it, actually, there was a few shots. Where I was like, it's a very pretty shot for television. Yeah. Yeah. Great style. Great. And, and photographed incredibly well. And, and then I think once they left the pilot, they moved production to New York. They were, I think, gonna they were gonna stay in Toronto, but then for whatever reason, New York was became the play, and then but they managed to recreate their style in New York just as effectively as they did in Toronto. Except they had yeah. to leave their cow behind from the first episode. Cow could not come over the border. Yeah, they had to leave Gene <gasps> behind. Sadly, so it's a different cow, and the production was ready to paint the cow <laughs> to match the spots. Bitch, I was gonna say, dude, that animal handler is just like I gotta bring in a cow, and then it just stands there. You gotta have the animal safety, dude. That motherfucker made some money. Yep. Yeah. So that's uh that's kind of it. Do you guys have anything else from your notes that you wanted to hit about the uh about the about the pilot? I don't think so, man. I I'm definitely gonna check out more of this show. I very much enjoyed this pilot. Yeah, that was gonna be the sort of my question is because we always asked did we like it wasn't good. It's it's pretty clear that we all liked it wasn't good. Um Haas, you've seen it all the way through. Mm-hmm. I've seen uh the first season. JP, you've seen six episodes. My question <laughs> is, we all know we liked it. We all think not only did we like it, we think it was good. Is there a specific thing about the pilot that makes you want to come back for episode two? For me, it's, uh, I think, Walter Bishop. He goes from that uh, very, like, demented person. He was yeah. locked up in the insane asylum for a long time, so he's, like, lost it, but he's still a caring father in some, like, his own weird way. But then he's also done a really lot of crazy fucking shits back right. in the 70s with his partner, William Bell, and just like, I want to know more about that. And why, why did this man get so crazy to this spot now? Yeah. 
And what is, well, I want to know more about the pattern. All those pattern things are very curious to me. Cool. I, I love that. Um, yeah, sort of like re- Walter regaining his humanity have, after having been out of the world for 20 years. Yeah. He's been dealing with that nasty butterscotch pudding. <sighs> It's nothing worse than butterscotch. Butterscotch pudding is kind of like Game of Thrones. When it's good, it's good. And when it's bad, fuck, get away from me. Um, (laughs) JP, what about you? What brings you back for episode two? Very similar to what Haas said. I think Walter's character, because like all the other characters could just be transplanted from other shows, right? When John Noble is playing Walter. John Noble ceases to exist, and the the truly interesting character of Walter is in front of you, and truly, you're watching a character, sure, um, who's yeah. fascinating, who's interesting to watch, who's like idiosyncrasies are just mesmerizing, and he does it so well off the bat. Like he knows who this character is, he knows how he's gonna play him, even if he doesn't know all the insane shit he's gonna do. Sure, and I'm like from the story perspective and from watching an actor. perspective, perspective i will tune back in again to watch him do that type of performance art excellent yeah that's awesome i love that adam um for me uh yes both of those things um what is the pattern the amazing job of john noble playing walter and him disappearing into the role but the thing that really really hooks me and this is probably because i like moonlighting so much (laughs) especially once john scott dies it's clear that there's going to be a will they won't they with Peter and Olivia. Oh, sure. Absolutely. And so I want to see, I want to see Peter, how, if how he ends up winning Olivia over and does that, does that process involve him becoming less of an arrogant, smarmy, know-it-all and more of a regular dude, or at least finding out he peels away that caustic shell and we see who the real Peter Bishop is. And then the same thing, Olivia being kind of the super agent, does she, um, does she, is she able to exhibit the same sort of vulnerability that she shared with John at the beginning of the pilot with somebody else after losing John and and being betrayed by John? Yeah. And I've seen episode two, so I know already, or I, I already know that John's betrayal is a big it 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 affects her for a while and so but yeah like uh, just from the pilot I want to see how how long it takes her to recover from that betrayal and how it changes her and how it affects her relationship with Peter that's a very nice note and there's there's so that's absolutely like valid and interesting and that's just one plot line there's probably like seven more we can just rattle off where it's like I gotta see how this wraps up like yeah it's just so well done yeah and yeah yeah, well, we I could sit here and talk for another hour about the things they do just in the first ten episodes that to hark back to the pilot, like the the just sort of the throwaway sort of line between Broyles and Olivia about the the guy, his buddy who sexually assaulted those three girls. He's in an episode. He's in a couple well, episodes. Like that in prison, hopefully. That that's just a hook they throw there. It's not you don't even realize it's a hook, and then it comes in later on, which is fucking awesome. So love it. Yeah, love it. Love it. Love it. One thing I didn't realize in this episode, uh, Anna Torv and the guy who played John, John they were married. Mark Valley, yeah. They met on this and then got married, and they mm-hmm. were married for like, what, two yeah, years? Like, yeah, <laughs> not long, but. Not long, and they got divorced, but. Wait, yeah, who got married? Sure. Anna Torv and Mark Valley, uh, the actors who played Olivia and John. Oh, no shit. Yeah, had, had a little showmance, and then got a little show matrimony, <laughs> and then got a little show divorce, and. <laughs> <laughs> but that's Hollywood, baby. <laughs> <laughs> and all the while Lance Reddick was glaring at them <laughs> fucking Play, d- and playing Destiny 2 from his <laughs> Sherman Oaks home <laughs> um, Haas thanks for uh, thanks for stopping by hey no problem thanks for having me it's been lovely thanks for chatting Fringe yeah this is this is just go go watch it folks you will not regret it yep we're all big fans here uh, JP <laughs> <laughs> yes Adam <laughs> Wow. The anticipation here. What what are we doing next time? <laughs> next time we have a special treat. Um <laughs> we will explain the rules of this next time, I feel like. Yeah. But we're gonna be watching a little something called the Nash Bridges of Briscoe County Sprint. <laughs> this somehow is a dumber idea than this podcast is in general. And we're I hope we lose all of our listeners, but this is probably the, our magnum opus. This Lost on Lost itself is sort of a nesting doll of dumb ideas. You open it up and within, 
is a dumber idea, and within that, dumb idea is a dumber idea. So, Lost on Lost itself, dumb idea. <laughs> Mid-season break, talking about shows that may or not have been uh, influenced by Lost, dumb idea. And within that, the Nash Bridges of Briscoe County Sprint. <laughs> Do we want to get into real high level what it is? Um, do you, I mean, we, you could explain it real quick what it is. Sure. Okay. Um, so, uh, wait, who, I forget how we did this. Um, so, so those of you, those of you who listen to Lost on Lost pretty regularly, you're aware of the fact that, uh, before Lost, uh, Carlton Cuse and Damon Lindelof, uh, who, according to Mo, uh, Mo Ryan's book, Burn It Down, are kind of, kind of shit heels to work for. <laughs> but before, uh, before they did Lost, they both, uh, they both cut their teeth on other shows. Namely, for Damon Lindelof, he was a story editor on Nash Bridges. And, uh, Carlton <laughs> Cuse was the e- executive producer of The Adventures of Briscoe County Jr. Two very different shows. <laughs> <laughs> sort of sort of sort, sort of learn more about the men and sort of where they came from part of their genesis and and evolution into the uh the co-showrunners of lost we're gonna explore some of their earlier work so we're gonna watch three episodes of nash bridges penned by damon lindelof we're gonna watch three episodes of briscoe county jr penned by carlton Cuse. And we're going to talk about those six episodes of television for a maximum of 10 minutes each. <laughs> we're going to speed run each Here's one. the sprint. Okay. Now I got the sprint part. Also, the way we chose those episodes was Adam put the entire series into a random number generator. Oh, God. Here we go again. And we're doing them in random order, Here baby. we go again. You can't fucking stop us, Hollywood. Fuck you. <laughs> That's not actually true. They both only wrote oh. three episodes. And so, like... I think they're oh. just in chronological order. I don't give a shit. I like it my way better. <laughs> I mean, we, we, I could, we could put them in random order. <laughs> right now in the schedule, they're just in chronological order. Uh, and we'll probably have a guest. I can't imagine we wouldn't. We're still in negotiations to see who's willing to put up with it. But uh, yeah. <laughs> who wants to live that life other than who you two? Who wants to watch all that television for that? Yeah. But yeah, if you think that that's funny, or if you just think JP and I are funny, um, come on Tune back in next week. <laughs> for, for the Nash Bridges of Briscoe County Sprint. Oh, boy. Oh, boy. Yeah. Well, until then, Haas, thank you again. Thanks, buddies. Adam, Busher, I suppose you're both Adam. God that's damn it. Us. Thank you again. <laughs> thank you out there for tuning in to this episode of Lost on Lost. The Lost Effect. Yeah. I'm Adam. I'm JP. Do you have any idea what's going on? No. <laughs> <laughs> Lost on Lost is produced and edited by me and JP. We wish to acknowledge that we live, work, and produce our show on occupied land. Burbank, California is located on the traditional tribal lands of the Tongva, Chumash, Keech, and Fernandeño Tataviam peoples. Milwaukee, Wisconsin is located on the traditional tribal lands of the Peoria, Potawatomi, Miyama, and Ho-Chunk peoples. And Lost was produced in Hawaii on the lands of the Kanaka Maoli. Visit native-land.ca to learn more about the land you live and work on. You can engage with us on IG, Facebook, and Twitter at Lost on Lost One. You can also email us at we are lost on lost at gmail.com or support us with dollar monies at coffee.com slash we are lost on lost thanks to lostpedia and its community of contributors danny schmitz random.org and as always you the listeners for tuning in we're hosted at podbean you can hear us there or wherever you get your podcasts except myspace we're, we're not on myspace yet <laughs> <laughs> Oh, <laughs> my